Great. Yeah, so it, it's really a pleasure uh, to have been involved in this exhibit and to have this chance to, to talk about something that's been uh, occupying a big part of my brain for the last couple of years, but doesn't usually make it to the level of public talks. So uh, here on the left is a, a scene out of the, the larger case in, in the exhibit. Um, and there in the background is a figure that actually represents my day job as um, an oceanographer and computer modeler. And then in the foreground uh, is my contribution that I still don't really know how to classify um, its role in my life. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about the, the, the science in the background uh, because it explains what we were trying to do with the origami as, as part of this showcase. So the, the basic story, which uh, Rudy Neger, who's there in the audience, explained in a, a talk last week, is that kittiwakes and other seabirds are declining, uh, in some cases, pretty rapidly and over many decades. That's true globally, and it's true in UK waters specifically. On the coast of the UK, the decline in the kittiwakes and, and some other bird species can be directly traced to the fact that the sand eel off the east of Scotland are getting smaller not fewer of them necessarily, but at the critical time of year that the kittiwakes are trying to gather food for their chicks, um, the sand eels are, are just a lot smaller than they used to be. And that means more trips, more time, more energy to provide the same amount of food um, for the offspring. When we trace that back further, and the, the we here is um, a team that uh, was led by my former PhD student, Agnes Olin, who is also there in the audience, um, along with Rudy and collaborators at Glasgow, at Strathclyde and Marine Scotland. Um, when we trace back what's going on with the sand eels, uh, we find that it, it has to do with changes in the zooplankton. These are the, the little crustaceans and, and other animal life, um, maybe a few millimeters long, the species in that photo, um, that are swept around by the currents and, and provide really the, the base of the food web, or, or rather the um, the base of the food web that isn't microbes. Animals like the, the uh, copepod there in the, the photo eat microbes, which is the, the main form of plant life in the ocean, and then they turn it into food chains like sand eels and birds and fish and whales and humans. Now, not all plankton are the same, and through some very detailed and careful detective work by Agnes, um, we know that there's uh, different patterns in different parts of the North Sea that represent not just different stories about particular plankton species, but different relationships with climate change. So in the outer part of the North Sea, the, the North Atlantic coming in on the, the Norwegian side of the North Sea is a community that's dominated by that copepod I showed you in the previous slide, which has gotten lots of attention over the decades and is a big energy rich, big meaning four millimeters long big energy rich prey item for sand eels and other things. And it represents a connection with changes in the open North Atlantic. What Agnes found is that to date, the trends are really pretty weak. Uh, there isn't a clear historical change in uh, that community, although we, we have reason to think that it could change in, in future. Off the coast of Scotland, uh, which is crucial to the kittiwake colonies that we've been uh, looking at, it's not those species at all. It's much smaller zooplankton that have gotten much less research attention that instead of representing changes in the open ocean are really representing changes in the coastal zone. So changes in the North Sea itself were also changes over the land in Scotland that then are transmitted to the ocean by, uh, by stream flow. So there, this is the kind of distinction and diversity that we wanted to capture um, without getting into a lot of um, really uncertain or, um, or, or dry species detail. We, we also wanted to say something about how we know all of this. It, the, the instrument that, all, that this whole story relies on is a, a funny, almost Victorian piece of technology called the continuous plankton recorder that is towed behind ships of opportunity, ship, commercial ships, and traps plankton samples on uh, specially prepared pieces of silk. It's been doing this since the 1960s. Uh, the first surveys with it are back to the 1930s. And of course, there's all sorts of um, very fancy methods that people use now 
uh, to measure plankton. But when you have a 50 year baseline of a time series, you, you don't change methods in the middle of it. Now that silk is brought into the laboratory with its trapped plankton on it for later counting. Uh, this isn't work that, that, that we do here. It's a, a, a much more, a much larger scale enterprise led by the Marine Biological Association. Um, but what we started thinking about was the fact that if you take that silk and magnify it 50 times, it resolves into a, something like a fishing net with a maybe one and a half centimeter gap. And the, the diversity of plankton that are eaten by sand eels is suddenly this huge range, this very tangibly big range from very small things to very large things. And this is what we were trying to show. So let me give you a tour of, of some of what's in this origami display. And at some point I'll talk about uh, the origami itself. So here is Oithona. This is one of the small copepod species that's declining off our coast. And this is about the, the smallest that I can work before I just give up in frustration and throw it across the room. Um, this is, as you can see, barely big enough to be caught by a net like this. And the net, remember, is really a silk with a quarter millimeter aperture. So it's a tiny, tiny thing, but quite important in aggregate to the sand deals. Because this is a very small model, um, it took some work to get it simple, simple enough that it, I, I could actually fold it. Uh, and I was fortunate to uh, convince uh, Dasha Severova, who's a really wonderful origami designer and diagrammer, to produce uh, some uh, high quality diagrams of, of this model. Uh, so these are on the web at origamiplankton.org, a brand new website that I think is going to be rivaling TikTok soon. And, uh, and you can try this at home with just standard origami paper. The, uh, the, you, you follow the blue ribbon, and if you go all the way around, you get a, a, a copepod. If you get about this far and then diverge, th this is the traditional crane. It's starting from the, the same base, uh, what's called the bird base, that ends up being the base of a lot of, of origami. Next up along the size spectrum, here's Calinus pimarchicus, that big copepod I was talking about before. Uh, this model is about 20 centimeters, you know, 15 centimeters long and folded out of a piece of paper about like this. And here it is at two stages of its life, the adult and its juvenile stage that's about the same size as Oyathona. So uh, that's another aspect of the diversity that the, that the continuous plankton recorder is capturing on the silk. Th this design is more complicated as you, you, you might be able to see. It actually, although the basic body plan is the same, two antennae, a body, a tail, uh, it, it's laid out on the paper quite differently. Without going through the, the whole sequence, this is what it looks like. The, it, it's still in quadrants, a bit like the traditional bird base, but out here are the two antennas that fold up into these. And then down here uh, is some extra paper that can make the, the extra legs, these and the ones that are, are hidden from the top. And then you, you get the tail, well, the urosome, um, running down this way. So that's the initial collapse. And then it's really a matter of narrowing all of these things until it, it has a copepodish appearance. In, in the scheme of, of well, uh, sorry, I was just gonna point out that there's actually some, um, some logic to this diagram, uh, to, I mean, to this layout on the paper. There's six of a basic unit, which is just this triangle, uh, where if you fold in half from all three corners, um, and then allow a, a little fold going the other way uh, to let the thing lie flat, you get what's called a, a, a rabbit ear. If you put two of these together, that's the traditional fish base for making a, a traditional fish or a whale. And if you put six of them together, apparently that's a copepod. So a, a lot of origami consists of this kind of reuse and reuse and reuse of very traditional bases, very traditional folding techniques. And that's part of what I like. Uh, so it, it, in the scheme of, of things, that there are more 
technical and mathematical approaches to origami that have appeared over the years. That's not really what um, I'm interested in personally. Here is um, three versions of an origami cicada. And if you go check out on YouTube a, a video uh, produced by Wired featuring Robert Lang, um, who's the, one of the modern grandmasters, he goes through 11 levels uh, from this traditional cicada through um, this, which I think is like level eight, and onward and onward to more and more complicated designs. And you can see that in he's laying out um, this really complicated design, almost like a draftsman using circle packing methods and all sorts of arbitrary angles. But in the middle is the design worked out in the mid 20th century by Akira Yoshizawa, who's really the figure associated with taking traditional origami forms and giving them this new modern kind of uh, lifelike quality. And he was using, um, I, I think that this model is based on eight bird bases stuck together in a rectangle. And so that's, that's the sort of flavor of things that I've been exploring. It, it, it strikes me that uh, this process of finding simple mathematical geometric rules for capturing some kind of living biological uh, complexity is not really that different from my day job. Up, up here are uh, the kinds of, of, of thinking that we do to make the mathematical models that relate climate change to um, circulation off the Scottish coast or um, to uh, models of the, the actual process by which a, a fish finds a copepod and eats it as a function of ambient conditions or the, the budgets of nutrients that control the overall productivity of the system. And the, I, I think that really very similar concerns pop up. Um, there's choices between simplicity and realism when you're making a mathematical model uh, for scientific purposes or an origami model, how much detail you, you really want. There, there's simplicity and realism and simplicity and complexity. And those aren't necessarily the same thing although I haven't totally thought that one through. There's some other similarities too, like uh, the fact that you, know, you can, with a certain temperament, really aim for absolute precision and perfection. Um, or if you have a temperament more like mine, it becomes a matter of asking yourself, where is error acceptable? Where in the scheme can you soak up error and, and imprecision? I came across a quote by um, uh, Henri Cartier-Bresson uh, the other day, like the, the father of street photography, who said, sharpness is a bourgeois concept. And I like that. Uh, so people have written all sorts of interesting things in both the scientific realm and the origami realm about this choice between simplicity and, and realism. But I always uh, go back to Roy Lichtenstein, um, cow going abstract. I don't actually remember if I have any more slides. Let's see. I do, right, because I haven't finished the size spectrum. I'll, I'll just run through a few more things quickly. Uh, at the high end of the, the size spectrum, the largest things that sand deal can eat um, is a, a krill. Now these krill are a few centimeters long. Um, I, I could only include a little one because otherwise I, couldn't find a big enough piece of paper and also the krill itself wouldn't fit in the case. But I think that that actually mirrors the fact that uh, although a really big krill would be a fantastic meal for a sand eel, they're limited by the, their gape size. They probably can't eat one beyond a certain size. Maybe they can't catch it. So this was the largest piece of paper I could find. It's, um, it's a, a paper moving blanket, like for wrapping up your Chippendale cabinet before you put it in a moving van. The piece of paper, not, not the scale bar. Uh, and the reason that you, it takes such a big piece of paper to make a, a moderate sized model is really the, um, the, the uh, amount of accordioning it takes in the tail to rele uh, release enough paper for the legs. So here is a, a desktop version of the krill um, and the intermediate step on, on the way to it. So overall, here, here is the whole assemblage of plankton sitting on my desk right before uh, it went off to the Hunterian. 
And so at, at, at the small end are, are these little things like oithona that are barely caught by the, the silk net because they're too small, they, they slip through. And at the high end are the krill, which are also barely caught by the net because they're just so good at swimming away from it. And so there's, um, you know, when I look at this, I, I see a couple of things. I, I see, um, uh, you know, a, a world that we can't usually visualize made visible. Um, you know, I, I feel like I have better intuition for the world of a sand deal for having gone through the exercise of making it at scale. But also um, at the both large and small ends, there's this hint of the way the, uh, the animals escape from us, the way they um, find a, a ways to hide from even our scientific ways of detecting them. So uh, on the theme of things finding places to hide, I think that's a good point to hand over to Emily. That's wonderful, Neil. Thank you very much. So um, I know we have got some questions in the chat, but we'll take all the questions at the end, if that's OK. Um, so. Can everybody see my screen OK? Great. Um, so this is my first time talking about crochet. I've always just done it as a hobby. Um, and I spent a lot of time trying to think about, you know, what's a unifying statement about my crochet, my work, the world that I can say to bring this all together. But I realized that I'm not quite at that stage yet. So instead, I'm just going to talk about, I don't know, maybe about eight different influences that led to me making some crocheted anemones and anemone fish for the display in the Hunterian. And I wanted to start out just by playing a little bit of my music. Um, the first piece I'm going to play is Bowheads. And as you might guess, it's based on Bowhead whale song. A lot of my music is sort of about understanding animal songs better. Um, and in particular, I'm interested in animal songs that have some kind of relationship with human music, whether it's in the way they sound or the behavior that surrounds them or the way they're structured or so on. So this piece is based very closely on some recordings of Bowhead whale song. And sometimes I also like to explore what it might like be to be, I mean, sorry, what it might be like to be another species of animal. So in this next piece, um, it's based on the calls of five different species of owls that are found in Canada. And I have each instrument in the wind quintet um, sort of take on the character of one of those species of owls. So they're not only playing a call that sounds like that owl's call, but they're also sort of trying to behave like it in terms of how much the variation there is between calls, how much time there is between calls and so on. So for this piece, um, I didn't tell each musician what to play when, I made a score where they know what kinds of sounds they make and what their behavior is, and then they can play however they want so long as they follow the behavior for that species. There. A lot of my academic research is also about understanding animal songs better. Um, 
yeah, particularly, you know, what again, what they might have in common with us, not just in terms of sound, but also in terms of how they structure the songs, where they fit into their lives and so on. And then to relax, I like to crochet. Um, as you can see, I'm a little bit obsessed with sort of geometric crochet patterns. I've never been able to like follow a pattern and I don't like making things like sweaters where something has to be an exact size or shape. I like to make things up as I go along. Um, and so I end up making a lot of hats because obviously with a hat, if it's a bit too small, you can add a stitch. If it's a bit too big, you can take a stitch out. If it's really too small, you can give it to a child or if it's really too big, you could drink it. So um, you have a lot of freedom to make things up as you go along. I've always loved artists that use crochet in their work. And in particular, I really love the work of Ruth Asawa, who's an American artist who unfortunately died a few years ago, but she does, she did amazing, um, really enormous sculptures out of crocheted wire. I've seen some a few times in California and they're just amazing. It's really some of my favorite art. I'd also been hearing for years about the work of Diana Taimina, who discovered that you could crochet hyperbolic uh, planes um, quite easily. It's quite hard to make hyperbolic space with most materials, but with crochet, you can just add more stitches as you go around. So it's easy to make these shapes. Um, and I also became curious about these crochet coral reef projects, um, which were developed by Margaret and Christine Wertheim, who are science communicators. And they developed these projects um, where they would get, you know, many people in a community to contribute different pieces. A lot of shapes that are found in the sea, in fact, are hyperbolic spaces. Um, I don't know if you all can see me while the slide is up, but um, uh, corals, some of the surfaces of sea anemones, um, the, I don't know what you would call that part, but the little side flapper things on nudibranchs and so on. Those are all hyperbolic uh, spaces or the hyperbolic planes. So crochet is a really easy way to um, recreate things. So of course there's lots of other kinds of shapes in the sea as well. So typically when people are doing these coral reef projects, they'll you know give a bunch of different patterns or ideas to crocheters and knitters in the community and then everybody will contribute things and then they'll be put together. I'd always sort of wanted the chance to be part of one of those, but I've never been in a place where one was taking place. And then lockdown happened and uh, like so many things that happened during lockdown, I felt a little bit like a Guardian cliche. You know, I took up sourdough bread, then the Guardian had an article about making sourdough bread. Um, I started crocheting more, and then suddenly I noticed there were all these articles about people crocheting more. Um, I'm clearly not the only one, but it was a great coping technique. First of all, you know, while we were stuck inside, um, and second of all, I have to admit that sometimes I find long Zoom meetings very hard, but it's much easier to uh, actually listen if I'm crocheting under the, under the screen where nobody can see me. So um, I, yeah, I would have to say that uh, everything moving online has been very good for my crochet hobby. First, I tried out some hyperbolic shapes. I wasn't really trying to recreate any actual species of corals, but just make something a little coral-like. Um, here's, yeah, here's one of them. Uh, then I decided I needed to complement those shapes with some other shapes, so I got into crocheting tunicates. Then I realized that some anemones would be nice. Um, as you'll notice, these are quite similar to the hats in a way, because they also sort of have these little um, sort of legs that radiate out, for, radiate out from a central point. Um, I wasn't really trying to recreate any exact species of anemone, but I just was using sort of anemone-like colors and patterns. Um, then I realized I needed some seaweed, some barnacles. You can see some of the barnacles are closed. Some of them are open because they're feeding. Um, lockdown went on for a very, very long time. So I crocheted a lot of things. Um, I began to run out of space. So I was really glad when I found out that Daphne and Sean were looking for somebody to crochet anemones to illustrate their research. Um, what they've discovered is that if anemones bleach due to high temperatures, even though they may survive, they actually don't provide as much food for the fish that are living in them. So it's quite harmful for the fish. I had an anemone and an anemone fish but it was the wrong species. This was an Ocellaris anemone fish, which is the same species as Nemo. Um, and what they needed was an orange fin anemone fish. So I sent about 600 emails back and forth with Daphne and Sean to make sure I was really representing the magnificent anemone 
and the orange fin anemone fish properly. Um, one of the things that can make it hard to crochet anemones is they tend to vary quite widely in color. So, you know, it can be hard to pick the color that most represents that species. So I ended up doing, well, two um, healthy magnificent sea anemones and then one bleached anemone. And you'll see I was trying to recreate these colors here. And then here's my fish, uh, which again, I, you know, tried a lot of yarn to match the color of the orange fin anemone fish as closely as I could. Um, and here they are in the exhibit in the Hunterian, which is still up. Um, so it seems that my hobby has inadvertently also turned into trying to understand animals a little bit better. Um, and I have to say, I've gotten quite into like trying to illustrate things exactly. Right now I'm working on a maroon anemone fish. Um, and finally, I'll just mention one more thing. I've recently gotten into animating the anemones. I haven't added music yet, but I sort of can picture this actually developing into maybe some um, stop motion animation recreations of things that actually happen in the ocean with music. We will see.